Welcome everyone. I can continue to listen to this. It's one of my favorite artists, Damon Escobar. If you have not heard of him and if you are a lover of jazz, specifically the jazz violin, this is the place for you. I am Dr. Rosalind Shaheed. It is such a great, great pleasure to be here with you this beautiful afternoon. I know that some of you are um, engaged in lots of family activities and enjoying your summer. So I appreciate that you've taken the time to engage with us this afternoon. I want to provide an opportunity for my colleagues in a moment to tell us a little bit about themselves. And we really want for this to be a conversation today. Today, we are talking about Literacy is Liberation. We have been inspired by the great work of Dr. Kimberly Parker. We are also talking about uh, the essential practices this afternoon, specifically those practices that support secondary learners. We know that they deserve our specificity and we are here for it today. So Windows, Mirrors, and Restorative Practice is our topic. And I'm going to move forward so we can uh, do a little introduction. We'll start with my colleague, Jeff Austin. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here and I'm so excited for this session. My name is Jeff Austin. Um, I'm a literacy consultant at RISA. And um, like I said, just really excited and really um, pumped about um, today's topic. Dr. Laura Gabrion. Well, sorry, I jumped ahead. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Laura Gabrion. I'm also a literacy consultant at Wayne Risa and equally excited to learn alongside of all of you this afternoon. Jennifer Snap. Good afternoon, everyone. I am Jennifer Snap, as stated, and I am also a literacy consultant, and I am looking forward to working with you today. Wonderful, thank you. You see, if you are on Twitter, we uh, hope that you'll follow us at Wayne Risa ELA. And if you want to tweet about something that we say today or something that inspires you, please use the hashtag Wayne Literacy. You can follow me and my musings at Pi5, that's spelled P-Y-E in the number five. We begin by acknowledging the land on which Wayne Risa stands is the ancestral land of several indigenous tribes, including the Ashinaabe or Three Fires, which were comprised of the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi. We stop to acknowledge land and indigenous people because we want to use our platform to heal and to preserve. Indigenous people have been erased or misrepresented far too long. And this is an attempt to acknowledge that indigenous people are still here, they are thriving and they are with us. So in that same vein, I want to begin with um, a beautiful principle called the seventh generation principle uh, that is uh, given to us by the Iroquois people and it is the belief that we are all connected to the generations before us. We are connected to this land and the generations that we have yet to meet. So all of our decisions um, should be in that vein that we are planning for seven generations, right? 150 years later, when we won't be here anymore, right? But our decisions will be still impacting those folks, um, our grandchildren and great-grandchildren and great-great-grandchildren. And that is the vein that we come to you today to think about all the decisions that we make in terms of teaching, our practices, um, the, the, the books that we choose to use in our class work room are also um, going to impact many, many generations. So the rationale for today's session is really to be supportive. Um, again, we are leaning heavily into Literacy as Liberation, which was uh, 
written by Dr. Kimberly Parker. So we're focusing on this idea of helping teachers and coaches, school leaders to really co-construct culturally relevant literacy communities um, with the support and help of those literacy essentials. They center and ground our work. We're going to, again, use Kimberly Parker's Literacy as Liberation to empower teachers, coaches, and school leaders to build intentional and abundant literacy communities where each student's strengths are recognized, their funds of knowledge are valued, their identities are honored, and they find joy as readers and writers. It is our stance as a literacy team that literacy is and should be actionable, humanizing, liberatory, and evolving. We're all evolving, right? Um, and so, so should our practices. So just to recap, um, the previous day sessions. If you've been here with us the entire time, this is a six day series. And so each day really builds upon the former day. But if you, if this is your first time, you will not be lost because we leave no one behind, right? We're going to provide a space for you to engage right away um, with the knowledge that you have in the conversation that we'll engage in today. So day one was led by my awesome colleague, Jeff Austin, and he really talked a lot about this idea of the intersection between literacy and liberation. He helped us to define that, um, how we're using students' identities to bring that forward, right? And day two was led by my amazing colleague, Jennifer Snap. And she talked about how we really think about culturally relevant intentional literacy communities as a space where educators work deliberately with students to create a literacy environment that systematically normalizes the higher achievement of everyone in the community. And what she brought forth from Dr. Parker's book was this triangle that you see on the screen. And at the center of the triangle, it is our core values, right? It is the values that uh, grounds really this community, this culturally responsive community. We have to lean heavily into what we're calling asset-based approaches, right? So uh, earlier I mentioned this idea of funds of knowledge. That is the center, that is the core of the work, right? We also at the left bottom corner, of the triangle, you'll see this, uh, the language is encourage and nurture vulnerability. So what we mean by that is in order to build community, we must have safe spaces. Um, we must have spaces that are nurturing. And the final piece is we need to be driven, <coughs> excuse me, by collectivism and socio-political change, right? Because we know that there are some there has some harm has happened, right? To many of our students. I mentioned earlier, uh, the Native Americans, right? So we know that harm has been done. So what can we do to change um, those things? What can we do to be more supportive as we think about community? So we're gonna go to the next slide here. And I'm gonna give you a moment to read those, our intentions for today and how we'll do our work together. So just pause and read those over. So please choose one um, intention for today. 
And I want you to drop that intention in the chat because we know that we have to, just a moment ago, I had to turn my camera off because my son was here and I need to set my intention. So my intention is to be present with you, right? To commit to being present, including taking care of myself and my community and my needs, right? So I may need to do some of that, right? But I'm committed to being here with you. So please take a set an intention and drop that number in the chat. And if Jeff, if you can just share with me what is coming forward. Yeah, uh, we're getting a lot of ones um, coming forward. So engaging in humble inquiry, um, a few fours have come through. So that's uh, really just taking a learner stance. Um, and a smattering of twos. Um, about being present, as you just mentioned. Um, so really ones, fours, and then twos um, coming through. Beautiful, thank you. So today's agenda, um, we are, we've already talked about our rationale for the session. Um, we are talking about our, we just talked about our working agreements. We set an intention for how we'll work together today. And we're going to delve into this idea of how do you nurture a love of reading? We're gonna listen to Dr. Parker directly. And we're gonna uh, talk a little bit about this idea of asset mapping. How do we know how to recognize um, the assets that are already in our community? How do we leverage those pieces? So we'll spend some time thinking about that. We're going to you know, live into that word of community. In order to have community, we have to be with one another. We, we learn from one another. So we'll spend some time in breakout rooms, sharing our ideas and takeaways. And then we'll have time for a closing reflection that you won't want to miss. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm going to pause for a moment and provide an opportunity for you to listen to Dr. Parker talk about this idea of nurturing a love of reading. As you listen to the video, I want you to think about what affirms your current practices and what invites you to continue growing your practice this school year. So I'm going to play the video. I grew up on a farm in Kentucky, raised by my grandparents, who always encouraged me to read whatever I wanted. I came of age through books, really. There was no particular title, I think, that resonated, that sticks out as like the text that sort of changed my life or made coming of age for me. But I think what did really make it was the experience of being able to read in all of these different ways. I was not limited by, this is what you have to read. I had grandparents who just said, read really all you want. And so I was able to follow my interests. I think that books find you when they, when they need you, when you need them most. And so I'm sure all of the books that I read allowed me to be able to really think about who I was at the time, who I was becoming at the time, what I needed to read to be able to see that person. Really in the same way, kids um, need that freedom. This is the beauty of having so many books or being in a world where there are lots of books and that we never know what book is gonna work for what, what kid. When I became a teacher, um, I was really interested in why kids weren't reading. And um, sort of came to understand that it's because we don't necessarily construct environments where um, they get to read what they want, where they see themselves reflected in the books, and they don't have time to talk about it. And so over the years, that's what I've been doing, is trying to really make my classroom those spaces, and now much more working with teachers um, to think about how do you create those spaces, these intentional sort of literacy communities where kids can thrive. and. Um, really have great literacy lives. I think choice is really important, particularly for kids who never get choices. I mean, I think that what I know about working with young people, particularly black um, and other kids of color, is that they don't get a lot of choice. 
Um, and so they're reading sort of the same books all the time. You don't have to necessarily start with like an entirely different collection, but if you know that books are harmful for kids, if you know that they are not resonating with kids, then you can change it. You can start with that text. I would say to start with that one um, and then to build your classroom library. It'd be great, right, if um, kids have the access to books that they want to read, not books that we think they should read, but books they want to read, and we would know that by asking them. Um, and then go from there. It doesn't have to be this huge, overwhelming thing, which I think then makes us not want to do anything. But if we just say, okay, what's the, what's the one text, right, that if, out of my core text, if we're doing that, that I need to change, change that, build your classroom library, and then go from there, and then keep going. And I think that we need to think about, like, who are the people we want them to be? I want them to be people who love reading, right? And people are like, you have an agenda. I definitely have an agenda, right? My agenda is that I want kids to love reading. So you can't necessarily become a reader if you don't have the time and space to read and to not like books, like to read things and be like, this isn't for me. Um, let me pick something else. And so it's just that. It's the constant sort of access to books. It's the ability to see yourself reflected. It's the ability to have a conversation with someone to be in a community of literate folks, right, that we don't necessarily give all kids in ways that we know, right, research tells us that that's what they need to thrive. Ultimately, I want every child, every student, when they leave me, to have had a positive experience with, with literacy and can see themselves as readers or have reconnected to their reading lives, right? They're all readers. I think what we have to ask as teachers is if they're not reading for us, then we have to figure out, like, what's going on there, right? I never blame the kids. Something has happened to them um, that makes reading not pleasurable. And so I always think, like, I love that, right? I love a good challenge. I'm going to reconnect you through books. Like, I'm a book pusher. Okay. I'm going to just stop sharing for a bit so I can see your beautiful faces. And I'm going to provide an opportunity for you to just reflect um, for a moment on what's resonating with you as it relates to. Dr. Parker's work, her words, and we'll open up the space for anyone who would like to share for a bit something that's resonating with you. Yes, thank you, Heather. Love the idea of loss of choice. It's not a one size fits all approach. Um, many kids don't have an abundance of choices when it comes to reading. Yes. And I'm not able to see. I see a few more reactions. But Jeff, again, if you wouldn't mind reading a few of those. Yeah. Uh, Susie says um, ask them, asking them what they're interested in is really important. Um, and and, and I'll, I'll just say from my own presentation that that's something that resonated with me too, is because, um, you know, she really talks about um, uh, like ending that teacher centeredness um, and thinking that we always know what's best for everybody um, when that may not be the case. Kid, you know, we have to trust students to know what's best for themselves. So that was resonating with me. And then Laura says, um, you know, really making reading a priority um, by allocating time for it is, is critical too. Right, absolutely. Um, and so I want to um, share here a facilitation tip. So we decided as a team, that in this space, we want to provide opportunities to be vulnerable, right? Um, and so essentially, we have uh, shared some of our thinking, our beliefs around these ideas in this session and in previous sessions, but we also opened up an opportunity for you, right? Um, that is definitely an entry point for kids to know that there are, um, that our beliefs drive us. Um, so that is just an opportunity to build that community in your classroom to concretize this work, right? Like that is one way that we can operationalize the work of culturally responsiveness. So in addition to um, Dr. Parker talking about this nurturing and love of books, she talked a little bit about herself as a child and how the world of books were opened up to her. So I want for us to have that same opportunity 
And I want you to think back to um, one of your first encounters potentially with books. Um, it could be a coming of age book, right? And I want you to think about that book and what book really for you uh, supported you, shaped your identity as a young person. And just take a moment to drop a few of those titles in the chat. And then we'll give you an opportunity to kind of talk about some of those. Old Man in the Sea, thank you. Thank you, the catcher and the rye. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Song of Solomon. Franny and Zoe. I've never heard of Franny and Zoe. We'll have to talk later. <laughs> Thank you for those. Now, um, I want to give you a chance to kind of hear and talk with your colleagues about those books that really influenced you. We'll, we'll move into breakout rooms of three and we'll talk for just about three minutes or so. So once you name that title, just tell a little bit why, why that book was influential for you. And then we'll come back to debrief. Uh, all right, I'm going to uh, open the rooms. Um, We'll have four rooms. There will be two to three participants in your room. So um, enjoy the conversation. And uh, how long do they have, Roz? Um, three minutes. All right, three minutes, we'll bring you back. Enjoy. Wonderful. So thank you for engaging in that <clears throat> conversation with your colleagues. It is supportive and it's really beautiful, right? To have memories of books that shifted your thinking, that opened you up potentially to a world of books. For me, um, believe it or not, one of my coming of age novels was the S.E. Hinton series. Um, and I discovered it on one of my many walks to the library, the Detroit Public uh, Library on Woodward Avenue, if you all are Detroiters. So that would be a pastime for my friends and I. And so I discovered this novel. Uh, I think I fell in love with it because it provided choice, right? Um, it focused on teens. And it really was a book that I'm reading just simply for pleasure. It's not connected to a school assignment. So all those things um, made me feel connected to the book. Um, and I remember like going, talking to people <laughs> about this particular book that was then, this is now um, by S.E. Hinton. And so, because I love the book, so I brought the book to my students and I remember kids not being as connected and I was really shocked that they weren't connected to this book. Well, what I didn't realize in that moment that I realized now is that I was holding on to nostalgia, right? And I wanted their ex my experiences to be their experiences. And so I was thinking about my readerly identity and not the readerly identity of my students. So this book would actually not be, although I had a good experience with the book, it would not be a book that I recommend for students in 2022, right? Um, you know, I just think that there are characters and, and situations that might speak more directly to their experiences now. And so when I did a little digging, because now I'm very intentional about the books that I choose, right? I found um, Dr. Debbie Reese, and she talked a great deal about how many of the novels in this series, in this collection of uh S. E. Hinton books, they actually have, uh, have anti-Indigenous content, right? So now 
it problematizes the book in a very different way, right? Not just my initial student's reaction, but now have I brought harm to students because I invited them into a text or maybe I reinforced a stereotype, right? because I invited them into a particular text. So these are the kinds of ways that we start to build community, right? We share our vulnerability. We, we love our books, but we need to also be liberated from nostalgia, right? This is a book series that was really um, popular. I think I saw someone even mention um, the Blueford series, right? And many students were connected to these books. And, but the problem with some of the books is that it overemphasizes many of the stereotypes that are associated with being African-American and living in urban settings, right? And so what Adiche reminds us of is that the problem with stereotypes is not that they are untrue, but they are incomplete. They make one story become the only story. And so when we're working with teens who are developing who they are, their identity, right? We need to show a plethora of books because no group of people uh, is a monolith, right? And so we want to have humor and comedy and drama and science fiction, right? We wanna provide many, many opportunities for them to see themselves in, in, in different uh, ways. So this is an example of a book that, although many people uh, connected with these, this series, I would not recommend today. And Dr. Rudine Sims says, when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in society of which they are a part. So these are the things that we want to continue to think about um, when we uh, bring in books. Really what Rudine Sims Bishop is alluding to is access, essentially. When we first consider these access points throughout our lives, what do we want for our students to walk away with 10 years from now, 20 years from now, right? And one of the ways that we can do that is thinking about this idea of culturally responsive instruction. We have, we're, I want to name it explicitly and what we mean by that, right? So when we're talking about culturally responsive instruction in a classroom that is inclusive of culturally responsive and sustaining book titles, we need to be thinking about it in four dimensions. We're thinking about the academic success or intellect that students gain as a result of classroom and instructional planning. We're also thinking about cultural competence, right? So the books I named uh, moments ago may not fall under that idea of having cultural competence. How does this lift and heal students? How does it uh, support this idea of students building their intellectual identities, right? Um, and this socio-political consciousness, uh, we named earlier that some of those books may have had some content that would be harmful to indigenous peoples, right? So that's a socio-political awareness um, that we want for students to have around what they're reading, what they're internalizing, because these things actually do shape their identity, their cultural beings, and what they have normalized as societal norms, right? And last but not least, we want to provide spaces for them to have joy. Teachers and district leaders that are culturally competent, intentionally integrate literacy experiences that center care, love, respect, and age-appropriate social and emotional needs of learners. 
So this work is really built on um, Dr. Geneva Gay, Dr. Goldie Muhammad, and this idea of all four pieces need to be in place to have a culturally sustaining curriculum and classroom space. So these books are highly recommended. Uh, we Are the Water Protectors is a picture book written by, um, in response to the Dakota Access Pipeline. The book tells the story of an Ojibwe girl who fights against an oil pot pipeline in an effort to protect the water supply of her people. And then you'll see an actual uh, image from an, an event, right, where uh, folks came to protest this pipeline. So juxtaposing the two, something that seems really simple, right, a simple picture book, although based on life experiences, when you pair a text like that with actual footage or, or a photograph from an actual event, you've already elevated the conversation. You've already humanized these events, these peoples, right? You're, you're living into the seventh generation principle, right? Literally and figuratively, because we are thinking about how does the, how do the books that we choose elevate our society and, and weave in those four dimensions of culturally responsiveness in our classroom spaces? We highly recommend these books, um, Hair Love by Matthew A. Cherry um, and the beautiful illustrations by Harrison. This book, if you have not seen or heard, you know, it's an award-winning book and um, video series. It really just looks at a typical day of a dad and her and his daughter trying to do her beautiful hair. <laughs> He has a little trouble, um, and we found find out at the end that the mom is not there to support because the mom has been diagnosed with cancer, right? So it elevates a beautiful story, but it elevates a real social issue. It brings this consciousness level to something that many kids are facing, right? Um, and and we're bringing empathy into the classroom. This is why we read literature, to build empathy, to build character. Um, Schomburg, which is one of my favorite <laughs> new picture books, um, Schomburg, the man who built a library, uh, it starts with, where is our historian to give us our side, to teach our people our history? And it is written by, uh, it, uh, it is based on the life of Schomburg, who is an Afro-Puerto Rican. And it is just beautifully illustrated. And it basically chronicles his life and how he over time collects books to essentially prove to himself and his family and those who doubted him that African people do have a rich and wide history. And so his collection turns into the New York Schomburg Library. It is a beautiful, beautiful text. Um, you can just take a single passage and do so much work with that in any ELA or social studies classroom. And last but not least, uh, Jason Reynolds. Anything Jason Reynolds, I love. I love Jason Reynolds. <laughs> um, his new book, All the uh, Bright Ain't Burn That uh, Ain't Burn Bright, is really a look at um, our most recent struggle with the pandemic. It takes a look at one family. It the entire book, I think it's 300 pages, is three sentences. And it is layered on top of these beautiful illustrations that were um, uh, drawn by his, one of his best friends, who is Jason Griffin. I highly recommend um, that book. So these three books we highly recommend, right? For 21st century learners, for a variety of reasons, because one, the first and foremost is that it hits all those pieces around 
being culturally relevant and culturally competent. So here are questions that support us and when we're making these decisions around which books we're choosing to illuminate in our classrooms. The first is, how does my identity inform which books I choose to use with students? What narratives do I gravitate toward? I shared earlier that I was kind of grappling, right? Which books, am I bringing in books that were just connected to me? Or am I really taking into account um, who I have before me? And what narratives do I shy away from? I'll admit I shy away from sci-fi books. Although, if you come Thursday, I have more to share. I'm, I'm pushing my growing itch, right? And why? Why do I shy away from those books? Um, which parts of my identity make some books less attractive than others? And when I select a book that highlights characters or practices outside of my own cultural understanding, do I go out and look for information about those authors, the recommendations and the criticisms, right? So I want you to take a moment to just choose one question that you're grappling with. I want to put you in breakout rooms, not to necessarily answer these questions because these questions are personal for yourself, but what do these questions bring forward for your practice, right? So that is the conversation I want you to have in the breakout room. So we're going to go back and we're gonna think about these questions. If you can drop those into the chat uh, and only talk about <clears throat> what makes you feel most comfortable. But again, what do these questions do for our practice is really uh, what will guide those conversations and breakout rooms. And so we'll take about 10 minutes to have that conversation. So if you, I, I hope that you were um, had engaging conversations, um, conversations that made you reflect on your own practices. And I would love for you to just drop into the chat since we weren't able to go into every room to just drop into the chat, just one takeaway, something you're thinking about for yourself or something maybe you heard a colleague mention that you wanna take back with you. So it floats, I feel like it gives us, um, it concretizes things when we actually put those things in writing. So I just wanna take a moment um, to do that, to, to, to think about what is one takeaway from your conversation that you're holding. Go ahead, Jeff. Oh, I was gonna just uh, lift a few things from the chat for you since you're sharing your screen, but... Um... Susie says, um, you know, that their conversation reinforced the idea of giving students access to books that they can really relate to. So um, the idea of relevance. Uh, Colleen says, uh, update my practices in relation to what students read in my classes. And Rachel says, presenting a variety of books for students. Um, so that's awesome. And Tracy, before we, <laughs> you know, uh, Tracy and Sarah in under the buzzer, buzzer here. Uh, Tracy says, letting students determine the literature used in the classroom, that can be really powerful. And Sarah says, to have discussions about what they are reading, ask questions, and to actually research some of the authors and, and, and what's going on there. Yes, thank you. And I'm just toggled over to um, the Padlet. So you all can see this. Um, this is one of my favorite quick questionnaires around your classroom library. It's from Lee and Low Books, um, which is another publishing company that I highly recommend because their focus is to uh, select diverse text, new authors. Um, and so it really will give you a range uh, of access to different kinds of books. And so they really uh, go through for you to essentially audit to say, okay, what kinds of books do I essentially have in my classroom? Um, and if I do have books that represent 
diverse cultures, um, um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, uh, are they illustrated by a person of color? Are they written by a person of color, right? Um, and if there are main characters, if they are a main character in the story, do they possess a, a dominant role? Um, how are they used um, in the book? How are they characterized? And does it show their full humanity, right? Like those are the kinds of things that we want to begin to ask ourselves when we're selecting books, because a quick look at the cover could be a misrepresentation of what's inside. So you can't always tell a book by its cover. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna go back to our slides and um, remind you that these are some other ways for you to take action. These are, uh, we need diverse books on voices, dis disrupt text are just a few uh, places that curate book lists that are beautiful and full and engaging for students today. Um, and so just thinking about how we can invite students and families into our homes through these books, into our classrooms through these books, right, is a wonderful way to think about it. So we have another powerful passage and a powerful strategy from Literacy is Liberation. Dr. Parker talks a lot about this idea of asset mapping. She says, asset mapping has been described as the general, general process of identifying and providing information about a community's assets or the status, condition, behavior, knowledge, or skills that a person a, or group or entity possesses, which serves as a support resource or source of strength to oneself and others in the community. So this idea of asset mapping, I think is so powerful. Someone said earlier in the chat, you know, really kind of looking at the students that you have before you, right? Um, and one way to do that is physically map out the community. Go on what is called community walks with your students. Identify spaces in your school building. Map out your school building. Where are those spaces where students can truly be themselves? Where are those spaces where they can come to find a book that represents them or do a little writing, right? Or singing or whatever it is that brings out their humanity. Where are those spaces? So I wanna provide another opportunity for you to return to our Padlet. And we have here some choice for you. Um, you can choose to delve into choice number one, community walks that create bonds of understanding. Choice number two, school community asset maps. Or choice number three, and we're recommending because of the short amount of time, looking at pages six through nine, um, mapping your school, centering youth voice and school change. So these are three very specific strategies to support this bigger idea and culturally responsive strategy of asset mapping. So I wanna give you an, a moment to go to those texts, just choose one. Uh, we won't go into breakout rooms right now because I wanna provide the time that you need to just delve into one of those pieces. We'll take about uh, seven minutes to look over those. And then the takeaway, you'll just pull, put one thing in the chat that you're taking away from one of these strategies that are being laid out here. So we'll have seven minutes on your own. We're gonna turn our cameras off so you can take a look at these texts and then share one idea, one takeaway. Okay, we wanna welcome you back. 
when they have been a little less than seven minutes. But the beauty of the Padlet is that it has been archived here for you to return to. So we welcome you back. Thank you. Just take 30 seconds and decide if there's anything um, that you came across that you thought was interesting or something that's kind of resonating with you, maybe a new idea. Uh, and just drop that into the chat while you all are thinking about that. I want to point out this I thought was beautiful. Um, it was part of one of the readings and just this idea of thinking of community as gifts, right? So what are the gifts of, of head, hands, and heart? Um, where do you see those assets in the community and how those pieces can be brought back into our classrooms so that students can feel connected when we think about culturally responsive instruction, I oftentimes think of an image of a bridge, right? How can we bridge the knowledge spaces that we have in our academic setting with the knowledge, the funds of knowledge that the students bring to us very authentically and naturally, right? So uh, that is the, the point of the asset maps is to think about who do we value in our school community and how we can um, really leverage their stories. So you took a look at those. And the final question um, for our discussion today is, as a result of our conversation, what practices should we stop um, what practices should we pause, kind of yield, probably would be a more appropriate term, and what practices should we enact? What should we go with, right? Um, and I'm going to open it up to anyone to either add to the chat or just add out loud verbally something that they're thinking about a takeaway from today. Okay. I see a comment in the chat. Uh, yeah, uh, Colleen says, um, I read about community walks and I remember taking class walks in elementary, but not in secondary. Um, one of the classes I teach is entrepreneurship and I feel as though that class would be perfect for a community walk. Uh, many of the small businesses in our community are owned by immigrants and I feel the students could learn a great deal. Wow, that's so beautiful, thank you. And Rebecca says, I love the idea of community walks, seeing and experiencing the world through our students' eyes. I think this can be a powerful tool for both teachers and admin. I think so too, Rebecca. Thank you so much. So last but not least, we thank you again for joining us today. We want to invite you to continue the conversation with us. Uh, we have a session Thursday. We'll where we'll talk more about those essential practices. So we invite you back to part two of this session. Um, and we also have a dynamic speaker series coming to you. Dr. Kimberly Parker will be here um, and so many other thought leaders, experts and literacy experts. We also as a team and living into this idea of community, we are launching our equity-based disciplinary literacies network and we need you. We need your good thinking. We need your ideas. We need your energy, right? Um, and we need spaces where we can really cultivate the genius of educators and the students who they have the privilege and honor of supporting. So I thank you. It's 4.15 exactly. It's a beautiful afternoon. So enjoy your day. And I think we should have any other final thoughts, team? Thanks for being here. Uh, we definitely appreciate you. And uh, hopefully you'll join us in a, uh, one of the other professional learning opportunities. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. <laughs>